Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Remy and I'm a junior studying economics here at the college, taking Professor Raj Chetty's class. Um, and I'm also a member of the JFK Jr. Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on the park side, excuse me, park side and JFK Street sides of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag JFK Junior Forum Live, which is also listed in your program. You can also follow us on Instagram at JFK Junior Forum. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming Director of the Institute of Politics, Mark D. Guerin. Thank you very much, Remy, and good evening, and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum. We are very fortunate to have Professor Raj Chetty here in the forum this evening. He is the William A. Ackman Professor of Public Economics here at Harvard, and as our guest in tonight's forum. With his PhD from economics here at Harvard, he was one of the youngest tenured professors in Harvard's history, and his scholarship is and uh, research agenda has won notable credit and awards. He is a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Fellowship and the John Bates Clark Medal. Professor Chetty is also the director of Opportunity Insights, which uses big data and rigorous theoretical and empirical studies to both understand and hopefully to solve some of our nation's most vexing social and economic problems. And indeed, when one reviews his course uh, focus and his research agenda, it demonstrates his broad interests. Intergenerational mobility and inequality, access to education, the effects of income taxes on the labor supply, taxation of individuals, and corporate taxation. In awarding him the prestigious fellowship, the MacArthur Foundation said of Professor Chetty, by asking simple, penetrating questions and developing rigorous theoretical and empirical tests, Chetty's timely, often surprising findings in applied economics are illuminating key policy issues of our time. So for all these reasons, we feel very fortunate to have Professor Chetty here in the forum. He will answer questions following his uh, lecture, which is entitled, Improving Economic Opportunity in America, New insights from big data. Join me in welcoming to the JFK Junior Forum, Professor Raj Chetty. Thanks Mark. Thanks, Mark, for the very warm introduction. Thank you all for being here. It's, it's really a pleasure to have a chance to speak at the forum here today. So I'm going to talk about how we can improve economic opportunity at a very local level in our own communities, in our own colleges, in our own institutions. But I want to start at a much bigger picture level by talking about the American dream, which, as you all know, is a multifaceted, complicated concept that means different things to different people. But I want to distill it to a simple statistic that we can measure systematically in the data, uh, which is a way that the American dream has traditionally been conceptualized, the idea that through hard work, any child in America should have the chance of moving up relative to their parents in the income distribution. So in this first chart here, um, my colleagues and I set about just computing a very simple statistic, what fraction of children go on to earn more than their parents did based on the year in which they're born. So what you can see here is that for children born in the 1940s and 1950s, it was a virtual guarantee that you were going to achieve the American dream of moving up. 92% of children born in 1940 went on to earn more than their parents did. But if you look at what has happened over time, you see a dramatic fading of the American dream, such that for children born in the 1980s who are turning 30 today when we're measuring their incomes, uh, it's essentially a coin flip now as to whether you're going to achieve the American dream of moving up. 50% of children born in the mid-1980s go on to earn more than their parents did. Now, this trend, I think, is not just of interest to economists in terms of a, a big change in how the economy is functioning. I think it also underlies a lot of the political uh, and social frustration that people are across the country are expressing that America no longer feels like a place where you can get ahead. 
And so motivated by this broad trend, our research group here at Harvard, Opportunity Insights, is essentially focused on the very big picture question of how can we restore the American dream? How can we understand what is driving that national trend and figure out ways to potentially turn it around? And so I'm going to talk about the approaches we take both on the research and policy side to think about that problem. And there are really three broad um, kind of themes in what I'll be discussing today. So first, in our group, we use big data to study how to increase upward mobility. So much as you hear a lot about big data being used by companies in the tech sector like Amazon and Google to improve the products they offer, analogously, our vision is that you can use large data sets uh, to learn new lessons about how to tackle important social and economic policy questions, in particular here, how we can increase upward mobility. Second, rather than taking one particular topical focus, so many research groups, as you might know, will focus on one particular angle, like education or housing policy or things like that. Instead, we tend to analyze a broad range of interventions, organizing our analysis more from a life course perspective, thinking about the pipeline of opportunity from childhood to adulthood, which may include things like education, but importantly, as you will see, also appears to include lots of other factors that are incredibly important. And the third uh, important piece in a lot of what we do is that we take a very granular approach. Rather than looking at things at a national aggregated level, the starting point for much of our work is that there are often very sharp local differences in rates of upward mobility that we think we can learn a lot from and that point to new types of policy solutions. And so with that motivation, I'm gonna dive into that local area data by turning to this map here which shows you the geography of upward mobility uh, within the United States. So what we're doing in this map is taking data on about 20 million kids who were uh, born in the early 1980s, and we're assigning them to 740 different metro and rural areas based on where they grew up. Essentially, think of it as where they were born. And within each of those areas, we're calculating, we're estimating the average income for kids who grew up in low-income families, that is families at the 25th percentile of the income distribution, that's families earning about $25,000 a year. So we're basically asking, if you grow up in a low-income family in different parts of America, what are your chances of rising up? What is your average income in adulthood? So start by looking at the scale in the lower right of the chart. You can see that in the places in the darkest blue colors, for example, Dubuque, Iowa, uh, you see that kids growing up in families earning $25,000 a year, they themselves are earning on average about $45,000 a year when we're measuring their incomes when they're around 30 years old. In contrast, if you look at the places in the darkest red colors, places like Charlotte, North Carolina, for example, uh, you see that their kids born in families at the same income level, their average incomes in adulthood are only $26,000 a year. So they haven't, there hasn't really been much progress on average across a 30-year period, across one generation. So what you can see in this big map is that there are dramatic differences in rates of upward mobility across the United States, right? So you can see the broad regional variation for yourself. The Southeast tends to have much lower rates of upward mobility for Americans than the Great Plains, for example, uh, the West Coast and parts of the Northeast have much higher rates of upward mobility. Much of the industrial Midwest, places like Cleveland or Detroit, for example, have very low rates of upward mobility. So what this map shows you is that that initial picture of the fading American dream and kids' chances of climbing up not looking so great today, that actually masks the fact that there's a lot of variation in that story within the United States. So naturally, the question of interest to us as researchers and a question of interest to policymakers is why does upward mobility vary so much across places in the United States and what ultimately might we be able to do from a policy perspective to increase upward mobility for uh, kids who currently don't have great chances uh, to succeed. And so what I'm gonna do essentially in this talk is walk through a series of different explanations from a research perspective that we've analyzed that kind of shed light on the forces that might matter and then talk about how we're translating those research findings through our policy arm at Opportunity Insights to actually creating change on the ground in the ways that seem to be relevant given the data. So the first explanation that many people think of when they first uh, see these types of data is that maybe this is about differences in the types of jobs in different places. So perhaps in the places where you see higher levels of upward mobility, 
you have higher rates of job growth, you have the types of industries that are thriving that help people climb the income ladder. So that initial hypothesis actually turns out to be, I think, strongly rejected by the data. It's, it's not correct. And one way that you can see that intuitively from this map right away is if you look at a place like Charlotte, North Carolina, some of you might know that Charlotte is one of the most uh, rapidly growing economies by any traditional measure um, in the United States. So if you look at measures of job growth, for example, or average income growth, Charlotte is one of the places with the highest levels of, of wage and job growth. Yet, as you can see here, Charlotte is also one of the places with uh, one of the lowest rates of upward mobility for kids who grow up there. So that is not an exception. More generally, uh, if you look at uh, the relationship between rates of upward mobility shown on the vertical axis here. So this is basically the data that I had on the map shown on the vertical axis plotted against job growth rates between 1990 and 2010 in each of the 30 largest metro areas. You see that there's no real relationship between these two things. In particular, you have lots of places in the lower right quadrant of this chart places like Charlotte and Atlanta, for example, that have exceptionally high rates of job growth, yet somehow don't deliver very good outcomes for kids growing up there. So how does that add up? How can you both have a lot of job growth and wage growth, yet your own residents don't seem to benefit from that? So basically what's happening in cities like Charlotte and Atlanta is that they are importing talent. Lots of people move to Charlotte and Atlanta to get those high paying jobs but the kids who grow up in low and middle income families in Charlotte and Atlanta don't actually benefit from that growth. So what that shows you, I think the, the key takeaway from that is if you think about a lot of the economic policy discussion, think about, for instance, the tremendous attention that was paid to trying to get Amazon to various cities. There's a, lo a lot of cities focus on job growth and trying to get better jobs and so forth. And while that might matter at the broader macroeconomic level, it doesn't necessarily translate to better outcomes for kids who grow up in a given place, as you can see directly from these data. Okay, so that's point number one. So now coming back to this map, a second explanation that may come more out of demography or sociology that people often think of is, if you know what racial demographics look like in the United States, you know that places like the Southeast or places like Cleveland tend to have much larger African-American populations than, than other parts of the country where we're seeing higher rates of upward mobility. So when you look at this map, a second natural hypothesis is that, you know, perhaps this is about race rather than place. We all know that there are large racial disparities in the United States in terms of income. Perhaps this reflects the fact not that Atlanta has particularly low rates of upward mobility for white Americans, but simply that there are differences in chances of climbing the income ladder between blacks and whites. And what we're seeing here is a racial composition story. So we can get at that explanation by repeating the map that I just showing, uh, showed you and splitting out the data separately for black and white Americans. So what we're doing here is we're gonna focus specifically on men and I'll come back for that, to that in a second. Um, why we're breaking this data down by gender. But essentially what we're doing here is looking at the same map as what I showed you before, but showing the data for black men on the left and white men on the right. So the first thing, you know, when you look at this chart, you might think it looks like they've put these two maps on two different color scales. But in fact, we have not. They're on the same color scale. It's just that the very best places in terms of upward mobility for black men so a place like Boston, for example, where black men growing up in low-income families have average incomes of $28,000, the very best places for black men actually have lower rates of upward mobility than the very worst places for white men. So race matters to such a degree in the United States that it's almost like they're two separate Americas, one for black men and one for white men with essentially non-overlapping distributions in terms of outcomes, right? And so that's why it looks like the two maps are just on completely different color scales, even though you're just representing it on one uh, unified scale. So what that shows you is that clearly race does matter. There are clearly very stark differences in outcomes by race. Um, however, I would emphasize that even within race, there's so, still substantial variation. And so in particular, if you look at the map on the right for white men, you see that there are significantly lower rates of upward mobility 
in much of the Southeast and Appalachia in particular, relative to the rest of the country, you're seeing differences in average incomes of something like 10 or $12,000 a year across places, even conditional on race. So I think the takeaway from this is that race matters, but place matters as well. It's not just that low rates of upward mobility in the South are driven by, by race. In fact, for white Americans, there are relatively poor chances of climbing the income ladder in the Southeast. Now, in most of what I'm gonna focus on in today's talk, uh, I'm gonna concentrate on rates of upward mobility, thinking about kids who start out in low-income families and looking at their prospects of climbing up. But in the context of race, it turns out to be equally important to also think about the opposite phenomenon of downward mobility. So just to show you why that's important, I wanna to turn to this chart here, which considers the converse case. So what we're doing here is think about a set of kids who start out in high income families, families that are in the top fifth of the income distribution, and ask where did these kids end up themselves when they're adults? in which quintile of the income distribution, the bottom fifth, the second fifth, the third fifth, all the way up to the top fifth. And we're gonna again break that data down separately for black men and white men. So the black men are in purple dots, the white men are in green dots. And what you can see I think is a striking pattern, which is that for white men, um, you see that those dots basically flow, uh, uh, you know, flow essentially horizontally to the right. So you see that the green dots basically are going, you know, remaining in that top fifth. So white men who grow up in high income families tend to remain in the top fifth or remain in the upper middle class when they themselves are adults. Whereas if you look at the purple dots, you see that they're cascading down towards the bottom where even if you grew up in a high income family as a black man in the United States, you have a very high chance of ending up you know, uh, at the, near the bottom of the income distribution or, you know, even below, below the middle class. And so I think that's a very disheartening fact about race in America. You might have thought that at some point with a sufficient level of affluence, racial disparities become less pronounced. And this shows that that's clearly not the case. And so the reason that's so important is because I think this is fundamental in understanding why racial disparities persist across generations in the United States. So in particular, if you think about achieving the American dream, you know, kind of visually as climbing an income ladder for white Americans, it's more like being on a treadmill for black Americans, right? Even after you climb up in one generation, due to various structural factors that we'll talk a little bit more about throughout this talk, there's tremendous downward pressure on uh, black Americans' incomes across generations, such that even after you make it out of poverty, you have a very high tendency to fall back in the next generation. And that leads to a persistence of lower rates of income for black Americans relative to whites. So I think fixing that treadmill phenomenon for black men in particular is extremely important in, in addressing racial disparities, something that you see from this analysis. Now in the past couple of slides, you'll note that I focus specifically on men. Why did we do that? Turns out if you repeat exactly this chart for women and compare black women to white women, you find that there are no differences in rates of income mobility. Black women and white women who grow up in families with comparable income have essentially the same outcomes. They have the similar levels of earnings, similar levels of college attendance rates and so forth. So the black-white disparity in outcomes seems to be very heavily driven by men rather than women, which I think is useful in trying to understand what might be going on here. So you would naturally think about things like the judicial system, incarceration, various other factors that might play out differently by gender. Okay, so these initial uh, results that I've been showing you are at you know, a broad national or regional level, and they show you a couple of the broad factors that we think about, like job growth, racial disparities, and how they contribute to all this. What I wanna do next is show, is, is kind of the next step in our digging into this puzzle, is that a lot of this variation emerges not just you know, when you compare Charlotte to Salt Lake City to San Francisco, but actually at a much, much more granular level, at a neighborhood level within cities. So in order to demonstrate that, I'm gonna to toggle over um, to this tool here, which we've just publicly released a few months ago, called the Opportunity Atlas. So you can go to this website, opportunityatlas.org, and uh, look at this data for yourself if you'd like. Uh, and so what we're starting out with is <coughs> just the national map that I showed you initially. 
Same statistics that we were talking about, average incomes in adulthood of kids who grow up in low-income families colored in the same way. But what you can do now with this interactive tool is enter in any address you want or any city you want and zoom in to the data at a much finer level. And so what I'm gonna do here is uh, zoom into Boston um, first, just for local interest. Uh, and so just let's give it a second to, to load. Um, so what we're doing now is looking at this data by census tract here in the city of Boston. Zoom out a bit. Um, and so first thing to note, notice that you see the same spectrum of colors on the screen that you saw at the national level. So we haven't changed the coloring in any way. What you're basically seeing is that if you go from places in Roxbury or Dorchester to places you know, in Cambridge or up here in Everett and Revere and so forth, you see the same spectrum of outcomes as if you go from kind of Alabama to Iowa, right? It's the same range of rates of upward mobility. And we see that not just in Boston, but in many cities across America. You know, you go two miles down the street or even less than that, and you just see dramatic differences in children's prospects of, of climbing the income ladder. Now, some of this variation will probably strike you as intuitive for those of you familiar with Boston, right? So, you know, we're all familiar, kind of have the sense that Dorchester and Roxbury are some of the tougher neighborhoods um, and higher poverty neighborhoods and so forth. In, in Boston, much of the Western suburbs of the city are the more affluent places where you think of as perhaps having better schools and things like that. But here are some examples of things that might have been less obvious. So if you look, for instance, at Everett, Revere, uh, and places like that, um, you see much better outcomes than you do down here in Dorchester and Roxbury, even though average incomes and rates of poverty or traditional measures of resources would not look dramatically different. There's an even more local example. If you look down here within um, Southeast Boston, you look at an area like Savin Hill, down here in the corner in Dorchester, you see much, much better outcomes with average incomes of $43,000 a year for kids who grew up in low-income families relative to just nearby where you see $26,000 a year. So that's the kind of information that you can get from this sort of analysis where you're able to map kids back to where they grew up, importantly, not just where they live now. And by taking that longitudinal look, you can see how the very specific neighborhood in which you grew up really seems to play, play a big role at a super local level in terms of kids' long-term prospects. I wanna to turn to another example here that uh, helps us understand a little bit better how this is um, playing out. And so I'm gonna to go to an address in Brooklyn, 520 Sutter Avenue, um, which, which illustrates some related phenomena that we'll dig into in a bit more detail. Let me just see if this is gonna load. Um, give me one second. Great. Not the best internet connection here, but uh, we'll get there. There's a lot of data here. Let's, uh, okay, so there we go. So um, what we're doing here is zooming into an area called Brownsville in Brooklyn. Okay, so you, you see again in New York, you know, lots of variation across nearby areas. This area in particular, part of Brooklyn called Brownsville, you know, you don't see great outcomes. And I'm gonna focus in particular for this example on black Americans. Um, and so what you see here is, for example, in this census tract, the average income of black kids who grew up in low-income families was just $18,000 a year. Uh, and in fact, if you look at other statistics, which we have here, um, if you look at things like incarceration rates for black men who grew up in this tract, you would see that 33% of black men who grew up in this tract are incarcerated on a single day, the date of the 2010 census. So you see incredibly adverse outcomes in this particular area. So now if you ask, you know, what is this place? Um, if, you, if you look it up, you'll find that that's called the Van Dyke Housing Projects. So it's one of the biggest housing projects in the city of New York. And more generally, a pattern that you might notice here, which is I think visually striking, is that there seems to be a pretty sharp break in the colors. If you look you know, right here, you see red and orange colors, so relatively adverse outcomes, low rates of upward mobility, relative to if you just look kind of just below, you see much greener colors. So that's a type of pattern that you see in many areas. Now, the reason I'm highlighting this particular one 
is it turns out NPR, after we put out the study, did some interesting investigative work trying to understand exactly what's driving those differences in this particular area in Brownsville. And so I want to turn back now to the slides to talk through what we When people find out where Audra Palacio is from, they often react in disbelief. Well, how, how could you come from there and you live there? And it's like, almost as if it's like, I can't believe you made it out. Nearly 40% of Brownsville lives in poverty. And if you look at the Opportunity Atlas and zoom into Brownsville, a lot of it is exactly what you'd expect. Black kids raised in the area 30-some years ago now make about $17,000 a year, same as their parents. But once you head across Dumont Avenue, everything changes. Black kids from the same exact background are doing better than their parents, making around $26,000 a year. So what is it that's driving those differences? In the 80s, New York City had been hard hit by a recession. Then the crack and HIV epidemics. There was a part of Brownsville that was totally abandoned, the other side of Dumont. The New York City government sold over 16 square blocks of Brownsville to the East Brooklyn congregations for one dollar. Those blocks were dilapidated, run down. The city agreed to build infrastructure and provide cash subsidies for over a thousand affordable homes. They would start selling at $30,000 each. They were called Nehemiah houses, after the man in the Bible who rebuilt parts of Jerusalem. The family was growing and we needed something that was much better for the children. I didn't like elevators, up and down the elevators for my children, because it was a lot of people living in the housing projects. Audra Palacio was six when they bought the house. I remember when we moved into the Nehemiahs. We were so excited. We had rooms, we had space, we had our backyard. Here's Reverend Brawley. He says the Nehemiah houses in Brooklyn gave children a space to do homework, a good night's sleep. When people have ownership of their properties, ownership of their community, you have a better chance of addressing all core issues, such as education and quality of life. After I leave the family, I walk just a few blocks to Dumont Avenue. According to the Atlas, it's the dividing line. On the map, it looks jarring, but in person, it's completely unspectacular. People bustle on their way to work, cars zoom by. Just another New York City street, it means nothing. But what side you're on means everything. Jasmine Garst, NPR News, New York. And so I think that story illustrates what we've learned, you know, digging into this data over the years, that we started out with this incredibly broad national problem of the fading American dream. But what we see is that it really plays out, you know, across just different sides of the street, as I think the story very nicely illustrates. And, you know, in the, in, in the lives of individual people like Audra Palacio happening to move from one place, one side of the street to the other in a way that really transformed her life. And so I think what that then points to with this kind of research background that I've given you, that there are these significant differences across place in terms of economic opportunity, not driven by things like conditions in the labor market, not driven by broad regional differences, but actually about very local conditions. What that then, you know, what I want to use that for now is as a base to then think about what can we do from a policy perspective to try to sort of level the playing field and create better opportunities for kids who are growing up in some of the lower opportunity uh, parts of each of the cities in America. And so in the second part of the talk, I'm going to turn now to more of the policy dimension, what we're doing on that front, and basically talk about two different c conceptual approaches to increasing upward mobility. So given the fact that I've shown you that there are these very sharp differences in outcomes across the nearby areas, there are, I think, two intuitive things that you might think about doing in order to improve kids' outcomes. The first you can think of as a moving to opportunity approach. If I see that living in the Nehemiah houses on the south side of Dumont Avenue does in fact produce better outcomes for kids. If I see kids doing better there, you know, the simplest thing that you might think about doing is maybe we can create more affordable housing exactly as they did there uh, for, for low-income families, and maybe that's going to give more people access to the types of resources that are going to help them rise up.
Now that moving to opportunity approach, I think is an important one to study because it's something actionable, it's concrete. And in fact, we spend about $45 billion a year in the US on affordable housing. So we already have a suite of policies that kind of try to do this. And maybe we can make those policies more effective in order to accomplish this goal. So I'll spend some time talking about that. But of course, we recognize that moving to opportunity is not a scalable approach. You can't, your plan to kind of address uh, mobility out of poverty in the United States can't just be to move everyone. There's no way that's going to be scalable. And so ultimately, you need to think about the second approach, which is place-based investment, trying to figure out how you actually sort of turn the red colored areas in the map into blue. How do you increase upward mobility in low opportunity areas? And so then I'll come back to talk about that approach in more detail after first discussing moving to opportunity. Okay, so to, to motivate the moving to opportunity work that we're doing, uh, I want to show you some uh, similar data from Seattle, where we're uh, doing a lot of work with the local housing authority. And so first, just the same kind of map in Seattle. This is just a snapshot from the Opportunity Atlas. See a pattern that I've now shown you in a bunch of cities where there's very sharp variation across areas. To give you two examples, if you take the Central District, for example, which is a place where a lot of low-income families currently live, the average income of kids growing up there from birth is about $26,000 a year. If, in contrast, you look at a place like Normandy Park, south of the city, the average income for kids growing up there is about $48,000 a year. Now, I picked those two examples as opposed to an example on the east side of the lake, for example, in Bellevue, because, you know, people in Seattle wouldn't be surprised to know that Bellevue, which is one of the most affluent parts of the city, it's where Bill Gates lives and so forth, see great outcomes for kids there, but that's not going to be that relevant for a moving to opportunity policy, right? You just simply are not going to be able to afford to have low-income families um, it's going to be hard to find affordable housing in those places. Normandy Park is an interesting example because it's actually not that much more expensive than the Central District if you look at rents. Like if you were to go on Zillow and look at rents, you wouldn't find dramatic differences in terms of uh, the rental cost in, in those two places. And so what that shows you is that there are a bunch of places that basically look like what we call opportunity bargains, places that would be affordable for low-income families, yet generate much better outcomes for their kids based on these data. So that creates the possibility that perhaps helping families move from the Central District to Normandy Park or some other place that looks like that could potentially improve their outcomes in adulthood. But you can't necessarily conclude that that moving to opportunity approach will actually work given the data that I've shown you so far because we don't have any direct evidence that when a family moves from place A to place B, their, their outcomes actually change in, in what I've shown you up to this point. We've simply seen that there are these observational differences in outcomes across areas. And so what I want to show you is how the moving to opportunity approach can actually work with the following example, uh, which is based on a study where we track millions of families that move across different neighborhoods in the US, cutting the data by the age of the child when they make a move. So to think through this example, what I'd like you to do is think about a set of families that move from the central district, where if you grow up from birth, you have an average income of about $26,000 when we measure your income, say, at age 30. Um, and think about a set of families that move from the central district to Normandy Park, a place where we saw much better outcomes in, in the map that I just showed you. And so uh, let's start by thinking about families who move when their child is exactly two years old. So that first dot there shows you that if you look at kids who move when they're two and track them forward 28 years with the data that we're working with, drawn from tax and social security records, we measured those kids' incomes when they're 30, and we see that their average earnings are about $39,000 a year. Okay, So that's for the kids who move when they're exactly two. Now let's repeat that analysis for kids who move when they're three, four, five, and so on. And what you see is a very clear declining pattern. The later you make that move from Central District to Normandy Park, the less of a gain you get. And if you move by the time you're in your early 20s, you get essentially no gain at all. And after that point, the relationship is completely flat. So what do you see from this chart? I think there are three critical lessons. The first is that moving to a different neighborhood actually does have a significant causal effect on kids' long-term outcomes. So it's not just that the people who live in the Central District are different from the people who live in Normandy Park. 
apparently if you take a given child and move that child from a red colored part of the map to the blue colored part of the map, you actually see really meaningful changes in that kid's life outcomes. So that I see is a very encouraging result because it shows that the answer in terms of solving the fading American dream problem may actually be quite local and it's not like something that we can't change. It actually does change all the time when kids happen to make a move just a few miles down the street. The second thing that you see here is what really seems to matter is childhood environment rather than environment in adulthood. If you move as an adult, we see in this study and various other studies we've done that it doesn't really seem to make a whole lot of a difference. It's about where you're living as a kid. And the third thing you see is that every extra year of exposure as a kid to a better environment really seems to improve your long-term outcome significantly. So the reason I emphasize that is, as many of you might know, there's a lot of focus in recent years, especially on early childhood intervention. So the idea that you need to intervene you know, before kids are three or four years old to really have big impacts. So what we see here is that early intervention can be quite valuable, but even if you help a ki kid move to a better neighborhood when they're 10 instead of 15 or 16 instead of 20, that still has a pretty significant impact. So it's not like the ship has sort of sailed by the time kids are four years old. Uh, the environment matters throughout childhood, and I think that's very important as we think about policies to both you know, help kids move to better neighborhoods, but also improve neighborhoods. Okay, so this shows you that the moving to opportunity uh, approach could pot potentially work. And the reason I think it's of great policy relevance is that if you now ask where is affordable housing uh, actually being provided in the United States? So in particular, you know, what, what's one of the biggest components of affordable housing spending in the US? It's on the housing voucher program. We spend about $20 billion a year giving about uh, two, two million low-income families housing vouchers worth roughly $10,000 per year. And so in this what we're doing here in this map is overlaying the most common locations where families receiving these housing vouchers actually live, currently live in Seattle. And what you can see is that those black dots where housing voucher recipients tend to live, they're concentrated in the red and orange colored parts of the map, the more low opportunity places. And so that creates, an, I think, an incredibly important opportunity to improve policy, which is to basically say, can we potentially help these families that are living in these low opportunity areas, getting assistance from the government, move to higher opportunity places, the opportunity bargain places in particular? And so, you know, given the set of findings that I've just shown you, we got a lot of interest from housing authorities around the country saying, you know, can we use this data and these facts that you've assembled to try to improve our programs to help more families access higher opportunity neighborhoods? And so in collaboration with the Seattle Housing Authority in particular, we started a pilot study about a year uh, ago where we're helping families with housing vouchers move to high opportunity areas in Seattle using three approaches. First, just providing information to tenants so prospective tenants, you know, giving you the type of information I just showed you that did you know your kid could potentially do much better if you consider this area that's a few miles away from the place you were looking at uh, initially. Um, interesting. Uh, second, uh, we th focus not just on the demand side of the market, trying to create more demand to live in these places, but we also recognize that uh, in a hot housing market like Seattle, landlords can rent their apartments to you know, five different people. They don't wanna deal with the complexity of the inspections and kind of red tape that comes with renting to a housing voucher holder. So we made a lot of efforts in collaboration with the housing authority to recruit landlords, give them an insurance fund if things go wrong, basically simplify the process, explain to them that you can really transform kids' lives by renting your units to, uh, to, to these families and so forth. And then third, um, is something I think many of us take for granted in the housing search process, the idea that you'd have a broker or somebody help you find housing, that exists at the high end of the market, but at the low end of the market, there's basically no assistance. And so we offer housing search assistance in the form of basically brokers who help you locate suitable units. So the key thing to note about this set of interventions is that the incremental cost uh, of providing this bundle of services beyond the housing voucher itself is very small. It's like a, you know, would be something like a two or three percent increment in costs on that $20 billion expenditure. Um, 
And so what we're doing is providing this, uh, this bundle of services through a randomized trial to involving about 1,000 families in Seattle. And we're not yet releasing the results publicly, but I can say, you know, just kind of as, as a rough description, this turns out to be incredibly um, successful. So lots of families that receive the small set of services, in addition to the housing voucher, many more of them move to high opportunity places than in the control group where they just get the traditional housing voucher and you're left to do you know whatever you want without any further assistance. And so that's a simple example of how without necessarily dramatically changing the amount we're spending on various programs in the US government, we can potentially increase their efficiency dramatically in achieving the outcomes that we want, okay? Uh, and so that illustrates, you know, that I think there's some capacity for the moving to opportunity approach to, to really have uh, a significant impact on, on these issues. Now, coming back to what I was saying earlier, we recognize, however, you know, despite the, the great potential there, that we also need to think about place-based approaches to, to, impl to, to improving the places that, are, that, that currently don't offer great opportunity. And so here, our team is spending a lot of time trying to figure out what we should do and developing strategies to, to uh, try to improve outcomes. Um, <coughs> but as you will see, this is a very challenging problem uh, to try to address. And I think the state of knowledge and where we are in terms of figuring things out is just less developed than on the moving to opportunity front. So what I'm gonna do is just walk you through how we're thinking about tackling the problem, starting by just giving a simple description of the characteristics of areas that tend to have high rates of upward mobility. So ideally what we'd like to do is basically figure out the recipe for success in places like Savin Hill or parts of Boston that have very high rates of upward mobility. What are they doing that is leading to better outcomes for kids and how can we replicate that elsewhere? So it's quite hard to figure out that recipe. The first thing that you might try to do is basically ask, are there some systematic characteristics, predictive factors of the types of places that tend to have high rates of upward mobility? And so it turns out we've combed, you know, various different types of factors that sociologists and economists have talked about over the years. And it turns out there are four things that, that are pretty common patterns of places that tend to have high rates of upward mobility. First, they tend to have lower poverty rates. So you could see that in some of the maps that I was showing you, the places with the really concentrated dense poverty tend to have low rates of upward mobility. Second, you find that places that have more stable family structures, so for instance, more two-parent families, also tend to have higher rates of upward mobility. That's just a very strong pattern in the data. Third, you find that places with greater social capital, so the idea of social capital is actually popularized by Bob Putnam here at the Kennedy School in his famous book, Bowling Alone, um, so by the types of measures Bob and others have constructed, places that have more social capital, so think about Salt Lake City with the Mormon Church as being a canonical example that people cite of a place that has a lot of social capital, those sorts of places where someone else might help you out even if you're not doing well, they tend to have high rates of upward mobility. And then fourth, as you might expect intuitively, places that tend to have better schools, uh, better public schools, uh, tend to have higher rates of upward mobility as well. So education, you know, clearly seems to be a strongly predictive factor and an important causal factor based not just on this analysis, but various studies that we and, and others have done. So that gives you, you know, not necessarily, like importantly, this doesn't tell you exactly what you should do to try to improve upward mobility in a given place, but it gives you some clues about the types of things one should focus on and shows in particular that, you know, it's, it's, it's not just about schools, it's not just about poverty rates, it's like a complex combination of factors. So what we're doing, given that knowledge, is focusing on a handful of cities that are especially interested in trying to tackle these issues in a data-driven way. And so I'll just share one example of that. So I mentioned Charlotte earlier as a city with very low rates of upward mobility. So when we put out one of these studies uh, initially, turns out that Charlotte was ranked 50th out of 50 largest cities in America in terms of rates of upward mobility. And so they reacted to this in actually a very constructive way rather than simply being disappointed that they were ranked 50th on this list. Um, they ask, you know, how on the one hand can we be such a vital and opportunity rich community yet be ranked dead last and the odds that our lowest income children and youth will be able to move up the economic ladder as they become adults. And so they formed a commission and a task force to try to systematically figure out what they could do 
to try to improve outcomes for low-income kids in Charlotte. And so now, with our most recent work releasing the Opportunity Atlas, and here you're seeing that fine-grained data within Charlotte, we are now teaming up our group with um, uh, folks in Charlotte. In fact, many members of our policy team are actually in Charlotte today working with folks there, trying to think about how, given the data that we have, where we're able to identify the exact neighborhoods in Charlotte where outcomes don't look great and so forth, what can we do to try to improve outcomes there? And so the approach we're taking, given that we don't know exactly what will work, is to go based on the various correlated factors that I showed you and organize it from kind of a life course perspective. So think about the pipeline of opportunity from birth to adulthood, where you think about things like early childhood education, social capital interventions, creating better access to local colleges that produce good outcomes based on data that we've constructed, providing affordable housing in the places that we're trying to invest in as we develop them, and so forth. So basically bring a suite of services to bear um, to, try to tr try to improve outcomes there. So you'll notice here that I don't have any direct evidence on whether this particular approach is gonna work or which of these elements is most important and so forth. I think the simple fact is we just don't have the scientific knowledge yet about what the best way to improve communities is. That's something we will be working on as a research team in the, in the coming years and learning from these policy collaborations as well. So that basically shows you where the state of knowledge currently is. So in the last uh, couple of minutes, okay, if I take uh, two, three more minutes to, to wrap up. So I wanna end by presenting a different perspective on these issues of equality of opportunity that I think shows why all of us in this room and more broadly in the US, I think should care deeply about these issues. So the traditional argument for equality of opportunity, uh, as I think you'll all know, is, is based on principles of justice. So the idea that everyone should have a shot at the American dream, no matter what their background, that's kind of core of the American social fabric. But what I wanna end with is showing you that improving opportunities for upward mobility, even if you don't care about the principles of justice and you just wanna maximize total GDP, you just care about total economic growth, even from that perspective, you might be interested in improving equality of opportunity. And so to illustrate that, I'm gonna focus on one particular pathway to upward mobility, which is innovation. And so in particular, I'm gonna talk about a study where we analyzed the lives of 750,000 inventors, patent holders in the United States by linking patent records, the universe of patent records in the US to tax data. So we're basically able to track the lives of people who, who become inventors. Now I'll start with this chart here, which shows you the probability that you end up having a patent, that you end up becoming an inventor based on that proxy versus your parents' income. So this is basically plotting the fraction of kids who go on to have a patent by their mid-30s versus their parent income percentile. There are 100 dots here, one for each percentile of the distribution. And so you can see that in the US, if you happen to be born to parents in the top 1% of the income distribution, you are 10 times as likely to become an inventor as you are if you happen to be born to parents below the median of the income distribution. So one potential explanation for that striking pattern is the types of things that I've been talking about in this lecture, right? So it could be about differences in environment and schools, exposure and so forth. A different explanation that you'd at least wanna consider from a scientific point of view and assess its validity is that maybe this is about differences in ability. Perhaps the kids born to parents at the top of the income distribution, you know, presumably their parents had to be pretty talented to get there and we know there's genetic transmission of ability, maybe to some extent that's why those kids are more likely to become inventors. So one way in which you can piece apart those two explanations is by bringing in additional data that gives you a proxy for ability, loosely speaking, um, early in childhood. So what we're doing here is same vertical axis as before, fraction of kids who become inventors, but now plotted against third grade math test scores. So what you can see here is that if you happen to be at the top of your third grade math class, above the 90th percentile in particular, you're much more likely to become an inventor than if you were lower down in your third grade math class. That maybe makes sense intuitively. Quantitative aptitude is a strong predictor of, uh, of your likelihood of becoming an inventor. But more interesting for what we're talking about here is if we now cut this data by parental income, looking at kids from relatively high income families, families in the top fifth in the green, 
versus low and middle income kids in the gray, we see, I think, a really informative and, and striking pattern, which is that high scoring kids are much more likely to become inventors if they're from high income families. If you're from a low income family and you're really smart and you're at the top of your third grade math class, your probability of becoming an inventor doesn't look all that much higher than if you're you know, from a lower, uh, if, if you had lower scores. So to put it differently and maybe more starkly, in America, it looks like you need two things in order to become an inventor. You need to have high quantitative aptitude as measured, for instance, by your third grade math test scores, and you need to be from a rich family. And so if you think about it from that perspective, you can see why improving equality of opportunity and bringing those kids through the pipeline, the kids who are you know, on the far right in this gray chart, and you know, having some of them become inventors, invent the next important drug, the next breakthrough technology, would benefit not just them in terms of rates of upward mobility, but also all of us in terms of you know, a, a, an improved economy and improved outcomes for, for everyone. Now, the magnitudes of this phenomenon, this is not just a small thing. We show in this paper that this phenomenon of sort of lost Einsteins, lots of people who could have gone on to do great things but didn't sort of have the opportunities to do so, is extremely important quantitatively. In particular, if women, minorities, and kids from low-income families were to invent at the same rate as high-income white men, we would have four times as many inventors in America as we currently do. And if we think, as I think most economists do, that innovation is really at the heart of economic growth, this would have a dramatic effect on the American economy. So there's, I think, a lot at stake here, not just for low-income kids themselves, but also for the economy as a whole in trying to address these issues. And so let me end by coming back to the chart that I started out with of the fading American dream. I think you can take two perspectives on this chart. One is you know, a, a perspective of pessimism that you know, isn't it so bad that America is no longer sort of the land of opportunity as it once was. But as I hope I've shown you here, I actually think there's a much more encouraging message when you dig further into the data that there are still many places in America that offer great opportunities for success. And I think the, the challenge for all of us in this room and more broadly in the US is to figure out how we replicate the successes of those places uh, more broadly. And so I hope some of you will be interested in, in joining that effort with all of us at Opportunity Insights. Thanks so much. Professor, we, uh, I'm sure, have a lot to think about and to reflect with you on, and we invite your questions. There are microphones here. The rule is here at the forum to identify yourself and to keep your uh, questions brief, and of course, to end with a question mark. <laughs> and why don't we begin right over here? Yeah, hi. It should be on, I think. If you yeah, Hello? can you hear yeah. Okay, um, perfect. So, hi, I'm Lakshmi. I'm from the um, Harvard School of Public Health. This is incredibly fascinating. Thank you for taking the time to chat with us. Um, I was just curious about how gentrification kind of plays into these, um, the opportunity maps, mm -hmm. just because especially with Brooklyn, I know mm -hmm. that there are definitely parts of, of yeah. the city that there are a lot of different people that are moving in. Yeah. And so how does that kind of compare um, or factor into yeah. to, to the Great this? question. Yeah. So. Uh, let me answer that in a couple of steps. So the data that we're showing you here is for kids who were born in the 1980s and grew up in the 80s and 90s in Brooklyn, for example, right? So first you might ask, why are you looking at kind of historical data as opposed to kids who are growing up today? Of course, in order to look at upward mobility, to look at people's incomes in their 30s, you have to look at kids who were born at least 30 years ago, right? So that forces us to kind of look at a period before Brooklyn gentrified. So now naturally a question is, neighborhoods change, what is the impact of gentrification as Brooklyn, as you know, parts of Brooklyn at least have become much richer, do we think that map is gonna stay the same for low-income kids who, who are growing up there, or are their outcomes gonna change significantly? We actually don't know the answer to that question yet in a systematic way. We're, that's actually one of the projects we're currently working on, trying to assemble these data historically so that we can answer precisely the question that you asked. But I can give you some preliminary sense that we have that you know, if you look at earlier proxies for later outcomes, like test scores, for example, we find in many cases that even when a neighborhood becomes richer and people think, oh, things have gotten much better in this place, if you actually look at the test scores of low-income kids growing up in that area, 
you frequently find that they have not improved significantly. And so I think gentrification can be, you know, sort of an illusion. You try to invest in a neighborhood and you think, oh, you know, this neighborhood has now really turned around. But the, the, the problem might be that you've basically displaced a bunch of people. The low income people who are living there, you know, may not actually have benefited. So I'm not saying that that's always the case. And hopefully there are ways you can find where you would improve the outcomes of low income kids. But it's certainly an important issue to think about. Terrific. Thank you. Why don't you go right up here? Hi, I'm Julia Reifman. I'm an assistant professor at Boston University School of Public Health. I study how social policies shape health inequities. Uh, and I was interested in your thinking of uh, family structure as a driver of inequities uh, and of mobility. And I wonder if you've looked at incarceration and policing policies uh, as shaping family structures. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that uh, question. So uh, let me say a little bit more on the family structure piece. So one of the things that you find when you dig into that correlation is that it's not driven by the most intuitive thing that you might think of, which is maybe kids raised in two-parent families have better outcomes than kids raised in single-parent families. And the way that we can see that is if we replicate the analysis that I just that I talked about, looking only at kids who were raised in two-parent families, we see that children raised in two-parent families are less likely to climb the income ladder themselves if they grow up in an area with a lot of single parents. So that shows that it's not literally about whether your own parents are married or not, but rather it's picking up, you know, the fraction of single parents in an area is picking up some broader community level factor that seems to affect kids' outcomes. You know, maybe it's related to norms or other things going on in schools or factors like incarceration, judici judicial system, you know, missing uh, fathers, things like that. Um, and so, you know, on the uh, incarceration dimension, we think that could potentially be very important. So in particular, we find, for instance, that the neighborhoods where black men tend to have better outcomes tend to be places where there are more black fathers present. And why are black fathers often missing in many areas? It's precisely because of things like incarceration. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things we're interested in studying is how can you think about criminal justice issues or, you know, the, the factors that are leading to high rates of incarceration to begin with as a driver of these outcomes. I should say, in, in response to your question, our approach is not just to try, to try to answer that question ourselves, but all of the data that I've been showing you here, like in the Opportunity Atlas, is completely publicly available and can be downloaded. And so we're hoping other researchers uh, like yourself, perhaps, would be interested in using those data to, to answer those types of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah. This is working. Hi. Um, Brittany, just community member um, with some questions. Um, I noticed in the map of Boston that there was sort of, if I remember correctly, a bright red area in the former West End that sort of didn't match the surrounding areas. Okay. I was wondering if you could explain that. Um, sure. Well, I, I <laughs> that's a pretty hard question because I don't know every area in uh, that level of detail, but let me see if I can pull it up. Um, let's see if we can go back there. So you are talking about, I mean, I, I don't if know. If you zoom into downtown Boston? Yeah. And sort of up a little bit. So there's, it seems like, okay, you know. that Right here, is, West End. Yes, exactly. There you go. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think you have to, so I don't know, but I think some of these things you have to be a little bit careful in the following sense. So notice that we're reporting estimates here, you know, even for a place like Beacon, Beacon Hill, for example, where there are going to be very, very few low-income families. Mm -hmm. And so the way we do that, what's actually going on kind of under the hood here, is we fit a statistical model asking what would the incomes of kids at various different parental income levels look like um, based on the relationship between parent and child income in each of these neighborhoods. And so in some of these places, you are really extrapolating far away from where you actually have data in order to generate an estimate. So for instance, in Beacon Hill, how do you even have an estimate for how well low-income kids do? It's going to be a little bit more unreliable, right? Because you're kind of making a guess based on how middle class versus higher income kids do, how would we think low income kids would do hypothetically if they were to live there? And so, you know, in places like that, I would be more cautious in interpreting the estimates. So that's why I focus, you know, on places like Dorchester, Roxbury, Everett, you know, places where you actually have the relevant population. 
Um, and so it could be that's part of what's going on, you know, in a specific example like that, that you just happen to have a little bit of statistical noise in the data effectively. Um, it could also be that there's something going on there in particular for those kids. So like I say, you know, there's a tremendous amount of variation in these data. One of the things we're hoping, so we, you know, see each city, people with expertise in each of these different neighborhoods, as you saw with that NPR story, right? There was a very specific story for what was going on on one side of the street versus the other. It's impossible for us to know all of those stories in all parts of the US, but I think digging into that is exactly the type of thing that would be useful. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm Kaveri, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Belfast Center here. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, so you mentioned that well, one of the key insights is that the location where kids grow up matter. Mm -hmm. um, now, who's to say that there are other factors, more structural factors, mm -hmm. like say, you know, the tax rates or, mm -hmm. you know, ma more macro factors mm -hmm. that are perhaps more important mm -hmm. in, in what you call social mobility. And so now my second question relates to this. It's a more methodol methodological question. Mm -hmm. Why is social mobility your performance indicator here? Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, that does lead to some of your conclusions, the fact that this is your indicator. Why not say income inequality, which might still exist even if these yeah, location absolutely. for instance, why not income inequality and a combination yeah. of like say a gener general welfare level? Yeah, yeah, great questions. So. Let me let me start with the second one on you know why is this this the, even the objective that we're focused on upward mobility social mobility, uh, and so you know I don't necessarily think that it's the only thing that you should focus on, but I do think in America in particular and in general people care a lot about equality of opportunity, and people also care about inequality of outcomes, but I would say that that's more divided. So in particular, if you think about, you know, some people end up with much higher incomes than others. I think across the political spectrum, people have different views on whether the government should do something about that or not through the tax system, right? So some people have the view that high levels of inequality are undesirable from a social welfare perspective. We should divide the pie more equally. Other people have the view that, you know, some people ended up starting an important business or working hard and ended up making a lot of money. They should be entitled to keep that money. And I, you know, I think you can reasonably have both of those views. And I think there's significant debate about whether inequality in incomes and inequality in outcomes is or is not an important concern that should be addressed by the government. And of course, we hear that playing out all the time in the political debate, right? Mm -hmm. Where I think th I've found, and um, you know, I, I assume many people have similar experience, is that there's much more consensus on the idea that there should be equality of opportunity, even if there's not equality of outcomes. So I find, you know, from people like Paul Ryan to people like Elizabeth Warren, there's tremendous interest in trying to, to figure out how you improve equality of opportunity because I think everyone thinks you should sort of have a shot of succeeding no matter what your background. And so that motivates our focus on issues of opportunity where social mobility, upward mobility is kind of a measurable version of that. So now coming to your first question, why focus on these neighborhood level differences? It's not that we think the neighborhood level interventions are necessarily the most important thing. It's possible that macroeconomic forces could potentially be more important. However, I think when you break the problem down in this very local way, the fact that you can see outcomes, you know, as we see on the screen here, you know, in Boston, um, that are quite good, where if every place just looked like some of the neighborhoods in Boston, we would think America has tremendous opportunities for low-income kids. I think that can be a really good lens for understanding what types of policies, both at the local and the national level, could be important. So maybe we will find when we explore these data in detail that the places that have high levels of upward mobility have different sorts of tax systems. And then the answer might be not to change taxes at a local level, but change taxes at a national level. So breaking up the data in a local way provides kind of a lens or think of it as like a microscope, a tool to learn about national policies as well. So we have time for a couple of questions. Maybe we'll take a couple together. That's okay. okay. Why don't we go right here okay. and right here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chetty. My name is David Carey. I'm a fellow in the Advanced Leadership Initiative. Uh, two quick questions. The first is, what has been the response from business leaders who have seen this astonishing data? And more specifically, what can the business community do to help lift the outcomes for these kids given such widespread dysfunction in many government areas? 
Yeah. So I think business leaders are very interested in these issues because, you know, if you think about, so take a company like Google, for example, whereas what was a few weeks ago. So th their direct interest in trying to have a stronger talent pool of people to hire at those sorts of companies relates to some extent to trying to develop human capital of, of kids, you know, growing up in America, as opposed to having lots of immigrants uh, filling, filling the, the, those high skilled jobs, right? So there is some direct interest in addressing these issues. I think the angle that maybe surprises them most and maybe where there's a role to play, think about doing things differently is a lot of business leaders have the view that, oh, if I just come in and choose to set up my company here, I'm gonna tremendously benefit the people who were around there just simply by the existence of the business. But I think a lot of uh, folks have seen that the way this actually plays out is local residents are not necessarily happy to have you know, high-flying businesses that will have high-paying jobs move in because they recognize that they may not directly benefit from that, like that early chart that I, that I put up. So I think thinking about smart ways that businesses, when they choose to invest in a new area, can also try to develop programs. So it could be mentoring programs or direct pathways to get jobs within those companies when you're moving to a new location for the local residents in a deliberate manner, rather than just kind of assuming it's gonna happen through market forces. I think that's an extremely important thing to, to try to figure out. Great. And we'll take a last question right here. Thanks for the lecture. Um, I'm a UK journalist and uh, a Neiman Fellow here this year at Harvard University. And my question was about the intervention of uh, moving to opportunity. Um, it feels problematic telling people to move from one area to another area and mm -hmm. then leaving those areas what happens to those empty mm -hmm. areas and then what happens to these overcrowded areas that had all that opportunity? Um, maybe it's kind of obvious, but yeah, I, yeah. I don't no, understand it's, how it's that a, works. It's a, certainly a valid concern. So let me say a couple of things on that. So first, the way I think about the moving to opportunity policy is not that you're going to take a set of people who are happily living in some area and kind of ha encourage them or pluck them out and have them move somewhere else. What's actually going on is about 20% of low-income families in the US already move every year. It's a very unstable population where you know, lots of people get evicted, lots of people have other reasons to move. And so the way I think about what this program is doing is by redirecting that flow. You were already gonna move for whatever reason, and now we're just helping you make a more informed decision, have all the resources that higher-income folks would have, to make a choice that might help you c help your kids. We're not forcing you to go anywhere. You can do whatever you want in, our, in this program, but it's just a way to use taxpayer dollars to help people potentially make better choices. Mm -hmm. Now, the second aspect of your question is that being said, you still worry about what happens to the neighborhoods which have lower levels of opportunity, which is why I was trying to emphasize, you know, this two-pronged approach Moving to opportunity is kind of a short run solution. Let's optimize the, the $45 billion we're already spending, like why not? Mm -hmm. um, but then let's think hard about how to actually improve places, which is the more challenging problem, the work we're doing in Charlotte, work we're mm -hmm. starting to do in a number of other cities, which I completely agree is extremely important. Well, we thank you very much, Great. Professor, for being here. Thank you all for joining us. Thank Next you. week is a big week. We invite you to look at the program. We have three great forums next week, and uh, please join us at the forum at the Forum Times. Thanks so much. That was terrific.